this coming Thursday night, Erev Tisha B'Av will be Rabbi Dr. Brian Galbitz, Rosefi Ben Rube Nussin's third yard site. We commemorate it tonight with a shear in his memory and for the Leah of his neshama. Everyone here, maybe almost everyone here, knew Brian in some capacity. On his Maseva, if Brian would have had it, we would have had two words, but we have many more. The two words would have been Ebed Hashem. We believe Brian represented the ultimate Ebed Hashem. Ebed to the Melech. How did Brian know what an Ebed is? How do we know who the king is? If not through our Rabbanim. Brian developed early in life a reverence and a love for the Rabbanis. He believed that our rabbis truly understand the Masorah because they were given it to give to us. From an early age, Brian recognized in the Rabbanim of his life that he could learn how to be an Evid. I'll never forget the phone call I got from the Hebrew Academy in 11th and 12th grade when Brian called me and said, I know where I want to go to in Yeshiva in Jerusalem, in Israel. I said, how is that possible? He said, I met the Rav who I want to be taught in Israel. And throughout his life, everywhere he went, he made the Rav his Rebbe to become the Ebed he was. All of us know Brian, knew Brian in a different capacity. Perhaps, as I once heard someone say, we saw in Brian part of ourselves. So it was very easy to be in love with him. And I think in turn, Brian saw in the Rabbanim that part of Hashem that he reveals to us. Abbe Ephraim Goldberg was very close to Brian when he first moved here. And he was instrumental in many of Brian's decisions and especially in the, uh, the raising of his children and his development. He was always known as Rabbi Dr. Brian Galbert. And I think it's because he insisted that people understand that it is through the Rabbanim that we really can become the, uh, the Ebed Hashem that we all really seek to be. I introduce Rabbi Goldberg without any further ado, and I tell you all that in the name of the learning of Torah we do tonight, that we all find in ourselves that connection with Hashem that we all really are capable of and we all really felt in Swan Brian. So when the Galbit said they're going to invite family and a few close friends. This is what happens. Maybe we should have done it in the other room. I want to uh, begin by thanking you for the opportunity this evening. I didn't know Brian the longest, and I won't argue that I was the closest, and I'm not the smartest in this room. So to have the chance and the privilege and the opportunity to continue to express our love and what we've learned I'm so grateful to you for this opportunity. I don't know about for anyone else, but at least for myself tonight. There's a great Talmud Chacham in Yerushalayim in Ramad Ashkol by Weinfeld. That's a base medrash. And they started writing up his Divrei Torah sharing and disseminating his Divrei Torah. And I saw in the parsha a couple weeks ago, the Kiddush last year, in his shtibel, 
was sponsored by Sender Lilo Nishmas Brian, Baruch Tzvi Ben Ruvein Nason. And so Rabbi Weinfeld spoke about Brian, barely knew Brian. He'd met him twice, he acknowledged. But in that little short time, because that's who Brian was in, in barely a meeting, in a look across a room, whether you were a patient or a colleague or a friend or a Talmud, you felt so connected, you learned so much, and you saw the essence, the goodness of who he was. Rabbi Weinfeld had an incredible, incredible insight. Something that touched me very deeply when I saw that he said last year for the Yerat site, which I think about now and hadn't thought about before. He writes, he was Zoha that his Yerat site would be in the Yimei HaMetzarev. Why is that a schos? It's a schos for your Yerat to be on the 8th of Av, the of Tishabav, in Yimei HaMetzarev, in the summer. What's such a schos? What's a privilege? Of having a yurt site then. But what Rabbi Weinfeld, Yibod Lachaim Tovim Varuchim, understood Brian. He understood Brian's mission in life was to make people happy. Three years later, I can't say his name without crying. I don't have to tell you, and I'm not the only one who's not family in this room who feels that. So Brian's whole life mission was to put a smile on people's face, was to make them happy, was to make their life better, was to feel more gebenched, more blessed. If he would think, if he would know the pain he was causing people in the time of the year, that you were allowed to be happy, that would have caused him great pain. So what a schus it was for him that anyway we're not shaving and anyway we're not listening to music and anyway we're not eating meat or drinking wine and anyway all of Kla Yisrael is in his collective universal state of Avelis of mourning. He wasn't adding, he wasn't contributing, he wasn't detracting from our simcha. All of Kla Yisrael are memat in besimcha. And what a schus it was that a person who would never, ever be memayit in someone's simcha could never imagine diminishing or compromising someone's joy. What a schus that at least he left this world in a time in which he knew we're in Avelis anyway. Continued Rabbi Weinfeld, he said, you know, every death is really connected to Churban Abayas. The loss of life and the Shema transitioning to the next world is Churban Beis Mikdash It is the destruction of our Beis Mikdash. That's why we say, Because each Neshama that's taken from this world, each unique individual expression of Hashem that is no longer here is like the destruction of the Beis Mikdash. So when you visit a mourner, not in the nine days, and not on Erev Tisha B'av, you visit a mourner, you come for the mourner, you pay a shiva call any time the whole year. The greeting is connected to Churban Beis Hamikdash. What's the connection? Because the loss of the Beis Hamikdash is a loss of contact with the divine. It's feeling more in darkness, absent, lost, without Him and His providence and His love. And what the Beis Hamikdash was for us in our lives is what the role of a tzaddik of a neshama is. Each individual unique expression of Hashem. When they're around and when they smile, you know everything will be okay. And when they exude unending superhuman amuna, you feel stupid if you don't jump on board. And when they're always seeing the positive and optimistic and see the guiding hand of Hashem no matter what's happening, who are you to disagree? They are the revelation of Hashem in this world and like the Beis Mikdash represents His pulling back and our distance from Him, so too is the loss of a tzaddik, every Jew, every neshama, particularly the holiest, is connected with the loss of the Beis Mikdash. 
spoke on Shabbos. But the insight from Moshe Shmuel Shapiro, why is it that Moshe Rabbeinu and Unklus Taichas, he translates that Moshe Rabbeinu rebukes B'nai Gad and B'nai Ruvain, your Talmidim of the Maraglim. And his insight, a Talmud is anyone who's learned from you. You didn't sit in a classroom, you didn't attend a shear, you didn't read a curriculum, but in life we have Talmidim who see, who watch, who witness what we do, and we shared several sources. Rabbi Ryan shared with me a beautiful insight of Rabbi Avram Shor Shlita. His Lekach Va'aliba Vampir Ovos Ovos teaches Ha'amidu Talmidim Harbe. Have many Talmidim. Live a life in which you have many students. It's talking about people who are dedicated to Arbatzas HaTorah. You're in Rabbanus, you're in Chinuch, you're teaching Torah. Have a lot of Talmidim. Try to have an impact. Spread Torah. Lift the masses. But one does Rav Avim Shor Yesh Lai and Mazen Ogei L'Cholotam. Shalom Pirki Avos and Ogei L'Chol Yachid V'Yachid. Pirki Avos is not just written for people in Rabbanus or Chinuch. It's not just written for a mora, an educator. Perky Avos is written for every Jew. No matter what their career, no matter their profession, no matter what they do. V'nirek fi ma'sha shemati me'war na'gur of Moshe Feinstein Zatzal. She'omar pa'am bedrosh ha'masha omer b'chol yom b'tfilas ava rabba l'ilmo de l'alamed l'ishma v'lasos ki gam yelet ben yud gimel omer l'alamed bar mitzvah boy turns 13, he's saying ava rabba and he's saying, I have an obligation to teach. A bar mitzvah boy is an obligation to teach. A little bar mitzvah boy starting life of Torah and mitzvahs knows how to teach, what to model, what to share, is in a position of being a teacher. So the Moshe said, Every person is a malamid. Every one of us have an impact and an influence on the people around us by the way we live our lives. Because the way you live your life, the way you daven, the way you sing, the way you show kindness, the way you're positive, the way you're optimistic, the way that you you make Torah supreme, the way that you're proud of your family, the way that you're proud of the community you grew up in, the community you live in and everywhere in between, who you are and how you live and what you speak about and what your Shabbos table's like, you are a malamed. Everyone is a malamed. And that's what he continues and he describes having Talmidim Harbei. That's what it means. And I don't think I know anyone who had more Talmidim in life than Rabbi Tzvi ben Ruvein Nassim than our dear friend, than Brian. All of us in this room, older or younger, could be grandparents or could be his children. We are his Talmidim. We learned, we watched, we listened. We spend every day trying to emulate and trying to live up. We just finished, we had another wonderful, wonderful summer kolel. Ryan was always so proud, every learning opportunity in any part of the community, so proud and so supportive. Our summer kolel included. A bunch of young guys from all over come to spend the month of July learning. So one of their last nights, they were over for a barbecue before the nine days. And as I'm wont to do, in speaking to them, I referenced dear friend Brian Galbit. And when I was done speaking and everybody was schmoozing, I heard one Kolo guy say to another, I'm not exaggerating the story in Iota. I heard one Kolo guy say to another, I don't know who this Brian Galbit was, but every home I ate in over every Shabbos this month we were here, Brian Galbit's name was mentioned. It's the testimony of a, of a young Bachar not from here, who didn't know Brian, but who shared Mesich Lefitumo. He didn't know that I was eavesdropping and could hear. He said, I don't know who this guy was, but every house I was in over my month in Boca, every house, that's what he said, Bali Guzma, without exaggeration, every house. This Brian Galbert's name was mentioned. We're all his Talmidim. We're all meant to be Halavai, to live up to being his Talmidim. Yesterday I spoke to his good friend, Tana Garala. He's bracing for this yurt site, what it means. Today, another good friend, Rabbi Dave Cohn, sponsored in the Bima this week in memory of, of Brian Galbin. And just before coming here, I got a text from someone who says, quote, 
I can't make the Shila Ilu Nishmas the Tzadik Mamash. Rabarach Zatzal this is also a lifelong friend. His neshama should have an aliyah if it can get any higher. I'm sure he's already at the top. Because that's the legacy left for all of us. At the top of every way that we could measure ourselves and maybe, Dr. Gabbard, as you said, see ourselves in him or see the possibility of a best of ourselves in him or see who we could aspire to be in him. But Hebu Talmidim Harbe, he left so many Talmidim all over the world. And he continues to live because his messages and his mottos, and the stories, and the Torah, and the laughter, and the mischievous giggle, and every part of the best of who he was continued to live. But Hamidu Talmidim Harbe, there are no more Talmidim, greater Talmidim, than his incredible family, than his children who each emulate him and are living representations of him, of whom he is so incredibly proud. He was in his life and he continues to be more than ever. When he sees the best of who they are and who they're becoming, and we continue to see him through them, in the beautiful way that we were raised together with Adina sharing those values and that devotion. So I want to share, already having used most of my time in the introduction and tears, I want to share one way that I think of him impacting us as his Talmidim. One of the ways that he was a Rebbe and is a Rebbe still to us from this week's parasha. Sefer Dvarim is a Musr Sefer. And in Sefer Dvarim, Moshe Rabbeinu begins this monologue that is the last of his life with sensitivity and subtlety and nuance, but without shying away from what the people need to hear, he reviews Jewish history until that point and tells the people what they could have done better, how they could have improved. When he gets to the episode of the Miraglim, Moshe Rabbeinu says to them very peculiarly, You know, not only did you impact yourselves, that terrible decision, that horrific judgment, that night you cried for no reason at all, not only, not only did you abruptly divert the course of Jewish destiny for yourselves, Gambi, also me, Hisanaf Hashem Beglachem, God was angry at me because of you. And he told me too, Gamatolo Savosham, I also can't go in because of you. And the first one that I'm bad, but really all jump and ask, where in the story of the Miraglim do we see Hashem get angry at Moshe Rabbeinu? Hashem, Moshe had his own challenge with Hashem. And we know independently he wasn't allowed into the land because of an episode of Memoriva. What does that have to do with the Miraglim? The Ramban is bothered by this question, as are all the Mepharshim. What is Moshe Rabbeinu talking about? It's like he's trying to pile on, or he's trying to distract or divert as if he has no guilt he did nothing wrong. Oh yeah, me too. I also can't go in. Not because of me. That also is you miserable, incorrigible people. You did everything wrong. What did the Miraglim have to do with the Moshe Rabbeinu? So the Ramban answers that Moshe didn't mean that. He meant Hashem was angry at you for the Miraglim. And he was angry at me because of what I did wrong. And I couldn't go in either. And Moshe Rabbeinu was really communicating two separate things that even though it looks like he lumped them together, Moshe is intellectually honest to understand that the episode of the Miraglim was not the fault of Moshe Rabbeinu. But Dorachayim HaKadosh is not buying it. Dorachayim doesn't like it because Dorachayim says if that's the case, then Moshe should have pivoted. He should have said, you know, the Miraglim, you messed up, bad judgment, poor mistake. Oh, by the way, I also made a mistake and can't go in, but then move on. The fact that the text, the Torah, goes back to the story of the Miraglim indicates, says the Arachayim, that Moshe was not pivoting away from the Miraglim into Memoriva. He was talking about the Miraglim through and through. So where, 
Where do you see Moshe Rabbeinu assigned blame for the Miraglim? Where do you see Hashem getting angry at Moshe for the Miraglim? Where do you see Hashem telling Moshe he can't go in because of the Miraglim? The Arachayim gives an answer. He gives an answer. Kliakar also is bothered by this question. And the Kliakar says, what was the result, the consequence of the episode of the Miraglim? 40 years. Shana Leom, Shana Leom. They wandered in the desert. For each day of negativity, the 40-day mission to investigate the land, they were caused to wander in the desert for 40 years. Parenthetically, Rav Asher Weiss wonders, it doesn't seem like a very just punishment. After all, the hate of the Miraglim, how long was it? It's a year per day, so 40 years for the 40 days because their mission to Israel was 40 days. But one does Rav Asher Weiss, I don't understand. The Chet of Miraglim was not 40 days. It was one night. On their mission, they went, they investigated the land. On the mission, they went to the Kotel and Mars and Machpelah and they enjoyed the Israeli breakfast and they toured the land of Israel. It's when they came back and they gave the negative report. One day, one night, that was the mistake. So wander for one year. He has a tremendous insight, which I think also is very much reflective of one of Brian's defining characteristics for which we should all be as Talmidim. Says of Asher Weiss, we all live self-fulfilled prophecies. When we go into a such situation with an eye in a row, with a negative eye, pessimistically looking for the problems, looking for the troubles, sure of why it won't work out, then we create and we bring about that reality. The Chet HaMaraglim was not one day only when they came back. It wasn't just that one night that they gave their report. It was all 40 days. They went there ready and looking to find what's wrong. They went there looking to find the complaint. We know people like that. They live life already before they've woken up, before they open their eyes, something's wrong. There's something to complain about. There's something to be angry at someone about. What it is, they'll figure out. They just know the world is unfair to them. It's unjust to them. They have what they're worth of complaining about, being negative about, being hypercritical about. And now they'll figure out what to fill in in their mad lib of life of what to be angry about. The Miraglim went on this trip looking, knowing something's going to be wrong. And then they justified it. Then they rationalized it. So the mistake was not one day, it was the entire mission. But the opposite's also true. When we go in with an ayin tova, talmidim of Avram Avinu, when we go in with a positive and optimistic and everything's amazing and everything's going to be amazing, and isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing when you're going for experimental treatment, when you're going in and out of a hospital, when you're enduring unthinkable pain, when you're a professional physician and you know the likely conclusion of what you face and you still say isn't everything amazing and isn't Hashem amazing then you create an amazing energy and reality around you we have self-fulfilled prophecies in what we create so says the Kliyakar what would have happened if the Miraglim that night said you know got some question marks fruit's pretty big over there people are pretty big over there got some question marks exactly how we're going to do this but Hashem, if you say jump, we say how high. If you say get on board, we're in. Let's go. We got this. Let's do this. It's going to be amazing. It's amazing. Had they said that, what would have happened? Kleisro would have marched where? Right into the promised land. What wouldn't have happened? Miriam wouldn't have died. And with that, her merit, the well would not have dried up. And then the people wouldn't have been parched and dehydrated and complained they wanted water. And Moshe wouldn't have been asked to speak to a rock and instead hit it. So says the Kliyakar, you know why Moshe says, You know, when you started the negativity that you introduced, it spiraled, it snowballed. It impacted me, not directly. The Miraglim wasn't my fault. That's not why he said I can't go in. But when you started the negativity, the negative eye, look what happened as a result. Created a negative reality. We wandered 40 years that made the opening for everything to go wrong. And that's why I, that's why I wasn't allowed in. There's many other interpretations, but I want to share with you a suggestion of my own. Maybe a chiddush. I don't know if it's true or not, but I think its message again is one of the hallmarks, one of the defining characteristics of our beloved Brian, and something for which we should all, I believe, be his talmidim. What is a 
common denominator of the Chet Maraglam and the Chet Me Marivel. Chet Maraglam, God says to the spies, go investigate the land, come back and report. Who are these spies? Everybody here knows the story. Ishachad, Ishachad, Lamatea, Vosav. Ish Rashi there says, the Kulam Anashim, Kol Anashim Shev Mikra Lashem Chashivas. These are not ordinary individuals. These were the princes of the tribes. This was the Moetzes Gedolei Atora. These were the greatest tzaddikim Rashi Yeshiva of the time. That's who was sent in and that's who failed. This is not a pedestrian failure. This is not something simple that we can relate to. There's something much bigger, much deeper, more profound that went wrong. Something perhaps noble in intent, but a gross miscalculation that led to what we're going to observe and mark. Shabbos, really, Motzei Shabbos and Sunday. Tisha B'av, a Bechil Adoros. Where did these Anashim Chashuvim, where did these great people go wrong? And what does that have in common with where Moshe went wrong? Is there a Tzad Shove? Is there a common denominator? Is there an overlap and intersection between where the Miragil miscalculated and where Moshe miscalculated? Such that Moshe can lump them together and say, Gam bi hasanaf Hashem. That got angry, got angry at me. Maybe, maybe I'd like to suggest, not he got angry at me because of the Miraglim, but Gam, he got angry at me for the same reason. Where you went wrong, I went wrong, and I couldn't go into the land. So what is that common denominator? Where do they both go wrong? What is the Tzad shava of these two stories? It's a long episode, which time does not allow, but I'll just try to say it quickly and extract and share the lesson, the lesson for all of us. It's based really on Rosh Hashiva from Karen Biyavna, Rechaim Yaakov Goldvicht, and others say it, and others share it as well. These Miraglim understood that their life and lifestyle in the Midbar, the Medrash tells us, the Miraglim knew that when they came into Eretz Yisrael, they would be replaced, displaced. They would no longer serve in that leadership role and capacity. Others would take over for them. And the simple reading or understanding of it is, were they so egotistical? Were they so self-centered? Were they so arrogant and power-hungry that they wanted to usurp the power for themselves? They were unwilling to have succession or transition? Can't be. Again, these are the Nesim, the Anashim Chashuvim. These are the who's who. These are the holiest of the generation. So where did they go wrong? And how were they miscalculated? What they went wrong was they wanted to continue the lifestyle they had in the Midbar forever. generation that came out of Egypt had unprecedented and unparalleled experience of being taken care of exclusively by Hashem. Traveling through that Midbar, they didn't have to shop for clothing. It grew with them and it never wore out. They didn't have to worry about water, hydration, because they had this chus of the Mer- Be- Be- Miriam, of the well of Miriam. They didn't have to worry about an army or a police force or any form of protection or security. We in our time, our generation have learned again how important and how necessary that is. They didn't have to worry. They're traveling through a desert and they've got enemies on all sides and people want to exterminate them even in their infancy before they've even begun. But they have no worries because they're on Klava Kava and They've got the fire. They've got the clouds of glory. It's all taken care of for them. They don't have to plow and plant and harvest and winnow and knead and bake. They don't have to work for food because the man just falls from heaven. It tastes like anything you want. Great shalom bias and families. Each person could eat what they want. Milk, flesheks, sushi, Chinese, pizza. The man fell from Shemayim. So what did Jewish people do with all their time? In these 40 years, that you don't have to work on you don't have to shop. You don't have to earn any income in order to pay for a life. You don't need to earn a livelihood in order to feed your family. The man falls from heaven. You don't have to worry about security, volunteer or professional or an army, conscription. You don't have to worry about anything. What did they spend their time doing? We know what they spent their time doing. They sat and they learned Torah. They sat and they drank from the well of Moshe Rabbeinu. They sat and they were being molded and formed as the first generation after our Sinai all they did was sit and learn Torah. And these Maragla, they said to themselves, wait one second. We go into that land of Israel. We're going to have to give this all up. The man's not going to fall. So we're going to have to all become farmers and set up an agricultural system and build an economy and work and labor and toil in the field. We go into Eretz Israel. We're not going to have a pillar of fire and clouds. We're going to have to set up a security force and an army and a police force we're going to have to volunteer and rotate. We're going to have to protect ourselves. 
We're no longer going to have water and so on and so forth. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? So therefore they came back and they gave the report they did not from some ignoble, self-centered, narcissistic motivation, not out of arrogance or ego. They did it because they wanted to remain fully and entirely immersed exclusively in Torah. They wanted to live in a spiritual cocoon and bubble in which they didn't have to integrate those teaching or that learning. They didn't have to figure out a way for it to manifest or apply in the world around them. And you know what? That's a very, very noble thought. It's a very beautiful intent. And just like, just like the generation in the Midbar, for its kufa, for a period of their life, while they were still growing, they were still forming themselves, that what was needed for them. The same is true for us. Brian reinforced that for me as my children were getting married and as we're thinking about life and Ashkafa Sachayim, the importance of supporting and encouraging and enabling a period, an incubating period of learning Torah before one goes on and applies that into the rest of life. It gave me a lot of chizik in that area. The Meraglam weren't entirely wrong. It's important for a tkufa for a period. It was for them and it's true now in our time. But Hashem Paskind, he said, you're wrong. That is not a permanent lifestyle. That is not the permanent and ultimate purpose that we are here. We're here to take Torah and integrate it and apply it and elevate and impact everyone around us. That is the uniqueness of the land of Israel. They're going into Eretz Yisrael. Eretz Yisrael has something that no other place on earth has. It is mitzvos, hatzluyos, ba'aretz. Mitzvos, sacred spiritual things that depend, that are conditioned, that connect to what? The lowest, the earth, the soil, the dirt. Outside of Eretz Yisrael, it's dirt. In Eretz Yisrael, there are mitzvos that are tuluyos on that dirt. It is that bridge between the spiritual and the physical. The Miraglam wanted to remain in a place that was purely and indefinitely ruchni. And Eretz Yisrael is the ultimate destination that is the bridge between those two realities. We're setting up an economy and a society and a security system where every part of life and living is the ultimate bridge and integration between the material and the spiritual in the physical and the heavenly. The Meraglam didn't get that. They didn't understand that. And we continue to pay the price for that. And I'd like to argue that the same was true with Moshe's mistake. Because Baruch Hu tells Moshe and Aaron, frankly, to speak to the rock. The Lashon of the Torah in Parshas Chuka says, V'dibartem el hasela. Speak to the rock. People are thirsty. They're complaining. You can imagine the decibel level is escalating and elevating. The people are yelling and screaming. There's an atmosphere of panic, of hysteria. Hashem tells Moshe, speak to the rock. There was a rock he used to speak to that put out water, but it wasn't working, the Medrash says. And he turned to different rocks and nothing was coming out. And feeling the pressure of the people building up with the rebellious tone. And Hashem saying, no, speak to the rock, speak to the rock. To a degree, Moshe panicked. The Rambam claims he gets angry. And he turns to the people and he yells, Listen, you rebellious people. Should I draw water forth from this rock? And he proceeds, He strikes the rock. And Hashem says, You failed to make a Kiddush Hashem in that moment. Because every moment is one of the two. Ben Abachaya writes, Pasha Zemor, Ben Ektashti, Besof Ben Yisrael, says, you know, I think this is another way that Brian lived his life. Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar says, there is no neutral, there is no power, there's nothing that we do that falls in between. It's not that you're either learning or davening, you're doing a mitzvah, or you're just doing a neutral thing. It's not that there's mitzvah avera and power of. There is no neutral, there is no power of, there is no Switzerland when it comes to hashkafa sachayim. Everything we do is either a kiddush Hashem or it's a chil Hashem. If you don't take advantage of the moment, if you don't grab the moment, then it's a chil Hashem. You don't just say, well, what did I do? I didn't make a chil Hashem. I didn't stick my head out the school bus window on the way to the uh, class trip. I didn't throw a spitball. I didn't uh, wear my yarmulke uh, cheating business. I wasn't discourteous to the uh, cashier. I was just neutral. Ben Abachai says, neutral is a chil Hashem. You have the chance, you have the opportunity to make a kiddush Hashem, and you don't. That is, that is a chil Hashem. That too was the way Brian lived his life. 
non-Jewish colleagues and patients who knew the yarmulke, which was, you couldn't miss, on the top of his head, proudly proclaiming and promoting, I'm a Torah Jew, and I smile, and I'm kind, and I go the extra mile, and I go up and beyond, and I never lose my patience. The Kiddush Hashem that continues to reverberate and echo three years later and will for a very long time in every opportunity. A Kiddush Hashem obviously in shul and on the boards of every institution in the community and a Kiddush Hashem in the hospital, but also a Kiddush Hashem on the golf course and also a Kiddush Hashem in the supermarket and a Kiddush Hashem on vacation, finding and bringing back a lost child and a Kiddush Hashem at every single chance and opportunity there is because the alternative is not neutral. There is no parav. If we are given the moment and the chance and we don't make a Kiddush Hashem, that is a Chil Hashem. So Hashem turns to Moshe and he says, Yan, lo amantem bi sheni. There was an enormous opportunity, an invitation here for a Kiddush Hashem. You didn't take advantage. That's a Chil Hashem. Where did Moshe go wrong? Why did he hit the rock? Where was the breakdown? So I'd like to humbly suggest. It struck me that word, vidibartem el asela. It's a lot of words you could use to say speak. The Torah Hashem specifically uses the word vidibartem el asela. And that reminded me of a previous conversation and earlier, the first conversation between Hashem and Moshe Rabbeinu. When Hashem tries to recruit Moshe to be the leader, the emancipator of the Jewish people, to be a shliach, to go down to Mitzrayim and bring them out. And what does Moshe say in reaction? He doesn't accept. He doesn't say, where do I sign on? He doesn't say, I'm so flattered, I'm honored. He says, I can't. And why can't I? Why can't I? What does Moshe Rabbeinu say? He says, lo ish dvarim anochi. I'm not good with speaking. I'm not an orator. I'm not eloquent. I can't articulate thoughts. Whether we understand it literally as a speech impediment from the medrash of his youth, we touch the coal to his tongue, we understand it as the Ma'aral does more metaphysically. That Moshe says to Hashem, Lo ish dvarim anochi. Why was he a lo ish dvarim anochi? Why? What made him a lo ish dvarim anochi? So the Ma'aral and Gvuras Hashem, Perach of Ches, the Maral describes what the power of speech is. Dibur. Dibur is, it creates a davar. Dibur is the bridge between the physical and the spiritual, this world and the next, heaven and earth. We have thoughts and we have feelings and we have emotions, but they, remind, they remain amorphous. They are intangible. What gives them expression in this world? What makes them real? What builds and creates? The power of speech. When we can communicate, when we use our words, the power of speech is what takes what is otherwise spiritual and it enables, it applies, it manifests in this physical world. It is that bridge. Da writes the Ma'aral. Who was so spiritual, Moshe Rabbeinu, who was so otherworldly, Moshe Rabbeinu, who we know one of the Rambam's principles of faith is to believe that he's categorically different, superior to every other human being on earth. Moshe Rabbeinu, who essentially continued to live in the heavens, he struggled with that koach hadibur to create that bridge of those two worlds, to bring down heaven to earth. So when Hashem tests him all these years later, and he says, we're poised to enter Eretz Yisrael, we're 40 years later, we're ready to go in, 38 years later, when the story happens, we're ready to go in, but Moshe, you told me when we first started the story, we first began this journey together, you said, you said you don't speak well. We're going into a land and a circumstance where you know what's going to be critically important, the tool, the instrument that is necessary and crucial, the koach hadibur. Because Eretz Yisrael is the bridge between heaven and earth. Eretz Yisrael is that place where there are mitzvahs, atliyos, ba'aretz. Eretz Yisrael is where we take the Torah from a concept or an idea, and we bring it and craft and mold a reality. And you know what it will need? A leader who has what? Koach hadibur. So Moshe, before we go in, vidibartem el asela. Let's see if you've learned the koach hadibur. Have you acquired that capacity? Have you learned that trait, that skill? And what does Moshe do? He strikes the rock. He has not. 
to his credit in some ways. He remains so spiritual, so holy, so above, so elevated. He's not. So Hashem says, not as a punishment, I'd like to argue, but simply as a reality. Hashem says to him, you were the leader for the Midbar generation, for the incubator spiritual lifestyle. But as we're going to go into a land and a country that are mitzvahs hatliyos ba'aretz, we're going to go into a land that when the Pasuk says, Hashemayim, Shemayim, Hashem, Ba'aretz, the sound of Ne'adam, the heavens are Hashem's and the land he's given man, the Sforno says, Chutzme Eretz Yisrael. There's one land that is his, even though it's on earth. It's God's embassy, even though it's here on earth, and that is Eretz Yisrael. It is the bridge of heaven and earth. Moshe, you were the right leader, the quintessential leader in the Midbar, but this new stage is going to demand new leadership, not as a punishment, but simply as a reality. And if we understand the Chetam Meraglim in that context, and if we understand the mistake of Meimariva in that context, then it comes out that when Moshe Rabbeinu says, when he says, Gam bi hisanaf Hashem, Hashem got angry at me also for the same reason. Not that he got angry at me, I'm suggesting, because of the episode of the Meraglim, we never see that. What did he mean? Why, where was your mistake, Meraglim? You didn't realize you're supposed to transition into a new world. And Gambi, that was also my deficiency. That was also my shortcoming. That was the reason that I too was not allowed to enter the land. Why did I choose to share this with you this evening? Because I think it's another way that Brian is a Rebbe and we are Talmidim to him. He had a tremendous devotion to Torah. The passenger seat of his car was always overflowing with a pile of svarim all over the place. And he was walking with children hanging off of him from every angle and a pile of svarim under his arm and always in a perpetual state of learning or preparing for his next chabura or saying over the chabura he just heard from Rabbi Zweig or Rabbi Rabinaviki or someone else he cared so much about. Torah was primary. Torah was kiem chayenu v'orach yamenu. It was, it was absolutely his everything. His valuing his chashivas Torah, and his kavod Torah, and kavod of rabbanim. It was everything for him, everything. But he also used the Torah, not a Torah that's abstract or theoretical, not a Torah that remains in a base medrash but a Torah that came with him to the overnight shift at the hospital when there was downtime, and a Torah that informed the way he was a physician, and a Torah that inspired the way he was a community leader, and a Torah that was how we live life, how we live every part of this physical, material, Gashmi world in which we live, how we use it and how we live it and how we navigate it. That the Torah was not something that was supposed to make us separate and apart, the Torah was supposed to make us normal. And that you could be an enormous Ben Torah. And you could be an aspiring Talmud Chacham. And you could have a Hashivas HaTorah and be normal. And live and be considered and connect with the diversity and the tapestry, not only of Kla Yisrael, but of humanity. That you could be normal. And this too you see in this week's parsha. And Moshe Rabbeinu is recounting these episodes and he tells the story, Take Anashim Chachamim. And Rashi says, Anashim, Nashim. Did you think that the community leaders, Anashim is Anashim, Chutz Lanashim, is a Kamla Afukai to exclude Nashim? So Matamud Lomar Anashim. So why does the Torah say Anashim? Says Rashi, Sadikim. Tzadikim. So why are Tzadikim called Anashim? So Rav Druk in his Eshtomid quotes his father, the Drash Mordechai, Rav Mordechai Druk. says, Kasher Yamagia Avi Mori Zatzal Apostle Zaya Omer Miyad Tomid. Kikan Kosov Barashi Hagdara Chadasha Mihut Tzadik. Here Rashi is telling us a new definition of who's a Tzadik. Anumurgalun Lachanos Beshem Tzadik Mishushakua Bavodas Hashem Ben Musar Beyira. We think to be a tzaddik, you lock yourself in a room, you learn Yom Valayla, you make a siyam on Kola Torah Kula, and certainly those are tzaddikim. But we think that we limit the term or the appellation, the definition, the label tzaddik is only for that person who locks themselves 
into learning all the time. You know who's a tzaddik? Anashim. Mishu enushi. Lo shakua ba'atzmo ela. Some lev makoros vivomis naheg ba'anoshiyus hu nikrat tzaddik. If you're a person who's connected to the people around you, you are of the people, you care about people, you are focused and you sacrifice for people, you are a leader of people, you're an example to people. That's who's a tzaddik. That's who's a tzaddik. To a degree, it's easy to be a tzaddik in the midbar. But be a tzaddik when you entered Eretz Yisrael. It's easy to be a tzaddik in the Beis Medrash. But take the Torah into your medical practice. Take the Torah into the communal leadership. Take the Torah into the Kirov and outreach. Take the Torah into hosting everybody at your Shabbos table and countless chaburas in your home. Take the Torah and have it guide and inform and inspire everything. Push it. Be a member of the Anashim. That's tzaddik. That's a tzaddik. And that's who Brian was. I think that's the ultimate legacy. And that's how we could be as Talmidim. To just be normal. A Torah of normalcy. A Torah that lifts and elevates not by trying to make us holier or superior or different, but a Torah that inspires and touches and makes us even more relatable and real and accessible, but agents and ambassadors and messengers of Hashem. That's who he was, fun and fun-loving. So many countless examples we all have. I don't need to take advantage because I happen to be standing here. But basketball games and golf outings and fun times, so many other capacities, trips I know his family took with others, and so many countless memories in which he took the Torah and applied it in such a real, real way. Gemara tells us, Why was the world lost? The Gemara tells us, because they failed to make a birchas a Torah. Ran has an answer, what does it mean? They learned Torah, they lived Torah, but they simply omitted the birchas a Torah. They didn't say the bracha that we say every morning, birchas a Torah, that's a capital crime. Millions of Jews lost their lives. The base of Mikdash was destroyed. We have a history with the Inquisition and the Crusades and the Holocaust because they left out something from the sitter? Because they omitted the Birch HaSatora? That's Shalom Birch HaBatora Tchilo? It's countless examples. But Rabbi Shaket has shared with us many times a very beautiful insight. Rabbi Yujant, is that his name? I saw elsewhere who say, Shalom Birch HaBatora Tchilo means the following. With this I'll close. Shlobercha b'tor etchila means we all have hopes and aspirations for our children and for ourselves. We give our children brachas. We give them brachas, they should have material and physical success. They should have academic and intellectual success. We give all kinds of brachas, all kinds of dreams and all kinds of hopes, all kinds of bumper stickers that are on the back of our cars. But for some people, the bracha of Torah, it's in there somewhere. Maybe it's at the end. But That generation, they gave the bracha. They wanted their children to be b'nei Torah, b'nos Torah. They wanted them to mold Torah families. But that wasn't the first bracha. It wasn't the primary bracha. It wasn't the most important bracha. It didn't come first and it wasn't the most important. It wasn't a matter of saying those words. It was a matter of the impression that we gave. And even though we learned and even though we lived, we failed to communicate through our words and our actions that passing on the primacy of Torah is the most important thing. We are Brian's Talmidim because he made a bracha on Torah every day. The Birchas Satora Torah B'Kavana, his life was a Birchas Satora, Torah in the way he lived it, his hopes and his aspirations, which Bli and Hara are being fulfilled in his children and Amir Tzashem, his grandchildren, but he taught all of us the role of Torah in our lives, that you can have fun and you can laugh, that you could lead, that you could participate, but Torah comes first, the Chashiva Sa Torah. We should continue to be his Talmidim. We should continue, the people who visit our home, to leave to say, I heard about this guy, Brian Galbert. I know I'm not alone when I say this, not a day that goes by.
in three years, there's not a day that's gone by. But at some point in that day, I haven't asked myself, what would Brian do? How would he react? What would he say? What would he advise? How would he be an example? You should continue, please God, for many, many years to come. Be that inspiration and that guiding light. And his beloved and beautiful family should continue to have nechama, comfort and strength through knowing what he did and does mean for every one of us. Thank you. Yeah, let's invite everybody to come make a bracha.